Swami. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time of music and song. And I always enjoy children's messages as well, even though I'm a few decades removed from that stage of life. Um, they often speak to me, which uh, is encouraging. So I don't know if I'm piggybacking off from you today or you're piggybacking off from me, but uh, we'll, we're going to support each other in our messages today. As I thought and prayed about what to share this morning, um, I felt led to explore the idea of an abundant life. Um, I often have takeaways when I'm in conversation with people, like I hope you do. And a few years ago, I spent some time um, with my missionary brother-in-law, Craig, Catherine's brother, and he was sharing with me a little bit of his purpose and, and his motivation for being a missionary. And he referred to John, 1010 where it talks about um, Christ said that he came to give life and to give it abundantly and that stuck with me what that meant and I've done some homework on it and and thought about how that applies to my life and as we are here to celebrate communion Sunday the elements before us and it just kind of went together in my mind God led me in this way to explore this idea <clears throat> for them, um, for Craig and his family, um, the abundant life is played out in um, ways that they share um, nursing and, and basic medical needs to the people there in Ethiopia. They um, also drill fresh water wells, and these are avenues that allow them into the country, and then they use that to um, evangelize, to teach and raise up evangelists and plant churches, and also Craig is involved in uh, prison ministry there now. So we're going to be in John chapter 10. Uh, we're going to look at the first 18 verses. I'd encourage you to open your Bible to that, John chapter 10. Some background in verse, or I'm, I'm sorry, in chapter 9, I think it's good to get kind of context. John chapter 9, um, we won't read the whole thing, but basically Jesus passes by a blind man who's been blind from birth, and um, he ends up healing him. But let's read verses 2 through 7 of John chapter 9, just to kind of set the stage here. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with a saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So we have many miracles recorded in the Bible, and most all of them got the attention of the Pharisees. This one did as well. Um, they, they took note of this, and one of the things that they didn't like about someone performing miracles is that that person was practicing authority, was using power that they thought was rightfully theirs. They were the, the Pharisees were the spiritual leaders at that time, kind of like pastors, um, lay leaders, etc. They carried a lot of um, authority and influence over the people of their time. And when someone came along, like Jesus, who performed miracles, they felt threatened. They felt like their turf, their area was being invaded upon, intruded upon. The Pharisees supported themselves in opposition to Christ based on the principle that they were the leaders, leaders of the synagogue, the spiritual leaders, they were the pastors of the church, and because Jesus had not sat under their teaching, he hadn't attended their classes, he wasn't one of them, wasn't one of the disciples, that he should be looked at as an imposter, as a fake, as an intruder. And they really felt that the people 
were bound by duty to be loyal to the Pharisees and stand up against someone like Jesus or anyone else that was teaching the word. So this kind of brings us to chapter 10. In chapter 10, we're going to look at the first 18 verses, and this is Jesus' response to this situation. The Pharisees weren't really getting it. They, weren't, they were kind of missing the mark and weren't really getting um, what had just transpired in chapter 9. So let's read the first 18 verses of John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So there's a couple questions here that I would like to delve into. And basically what I want to do this morning is just share what I learned as I was answering these questions. So what is this abundant life that Christ is talking about would be one question. What does he mean by abundant life? And the second one, what is it that Christ means when he refers to himself as the door and as the good shepherd? So those are a couple questions we want to look at. So let's have a little interaction time here. You guys can, uh, don't be afraid to speak up. So what would it mean, what does it mean to you when you hear abundant life? What comes to mind? Fulfillment? Okay. Pastor gave us some definitions, some descriptions of it this morning. What else? Even in a, what, how would the world answer that question? How would an unbeliever answer that question? Wealth, okay. All right, money, wealth. Notoriety, popularity. Security, okay. All right, good health. Comfort. Yeah, we all have our own definition of what that might look like. Um, and those are, can all certainly be part of it, whether they are eternal blessings or blessings here on earth, and that they are all good and well in and of themselves. We have in John chapter 10, verse 10 here, that's kind of our, our key verse. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Unlike a thief, the Lord Jesus does not come for selfish reasons. He comes to give, not to get. He comes that people may have life in him that is meaningful, purposeful, joyful, and eternal. We receive this abundant life the moment we accept him as our Savior. 
This word abundant in the Greek is parason. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that right. It means exceedingly, very high, beyond measure, more, a quantity so abundant as to be considered more than what one would anticipate. In short, Jesus promised us life far better than we could ever imagine. We see this in 1 Corinthians 2.9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The Apostle Paul tells us that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And he does it by his power, a power that is, a, that is at work within us as long as we belong to him. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Before we be begin to have visions of lavish homes, expensive cars, cruises, more money than we know what to do with, we need to pause and think about what Jesus teaches regarding this abundant life. The Bible tells us that wealth, prestige, position, power in this world are not God's priorities for us. We're going to be looking at a lot of scripture today for a few reasons. One, I think we came to hear the word of God today. Um, secondly, I think that scripture, we ought to use scripture to um, to explain and, and support other scripture. And thirdly, scripture says it a lot better than I would say it. So we are going to um, look at quite a bit. You're welcome to turn to these, but we'll be looking at quite a few. So I understand you won't turn to all of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In terms of economic, academic, and social status, most Christians do not come from privileged classes. Clearly, then, abundant life does not consist of an abundance of material things. If that were the case, Jesus would have, would have been the wealthiest of all, right? Would have been the wealthiest of men. But just the opposite is true. Matthew 8, 20 tells us, in Jesus' response, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't have a whole lot of earthly possessions when he was here on earth, did he? He often slept in different places. He didn't even have a home necessarily to call his own. Abundant life is eternal life, a life that begins the moment we come to Christ and receive him as Savior and goes on throughout all eternity. The biblical definition of life, specifically eternal life, is provided by Jesus himself. We find this in John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that you may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Here we don't see any mention of long days, length of days, health, prosperity, family, or occupation. Even though those things are good and well in and of themselves and might come as blessings from him, that isn't necessarily what an abundant life is. As a matter of fact, the only thing it does mention is knowledge of God, which is the key to a truly abundant life. As we consider communion and things here this morning, um, I think all of this kind of goes together. <clears throat> as we look at Jesus as being the key for that abundant life, I want us to think about the second question. We'll come back to the first. But I want us to think about the second question of what did Christ mean when he said, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. There's seven of these I am declarations in the Gospel of John. These I am proclamations point to his unique divine identity and purpose. This I am statement, Jesus colorfully points out for us the exclusive nature of salvation by saying, he is the door, not a door. He is the only way. Jesus is not only our shepherd who leads us into the sheepfold, but he is the only door by which we may enter and be saved. We find that in John 10, 9. Jesus is the only means we have of receiving eternal life. Familiar verse, John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. To get a clear picture of Jesus' meaning in this statement, it's helpful to understand a little bit of the ancient culture, especially of sheep and shepherding. Now, I've never owned sheep. Uh, maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you have had firsthand experience with them. We believers are often um, compared to sheep, which is humbling in some ways, but sheep also have some good traits as well. And some of this was um, described to us in the first few verses of John chapter 10 here that we read today. Of all domesticated animals, sheep are the most helpless. Sheep will spend their entire day grazing, wandering from place to place, never looking up. As a result, they often become lost. They don't understand how to get back home. They don't have a homing instinct. They wander and eat, and before long, they don't know how to get back to the sheepfold, to the corral, to the pasture, to where they belong that night. They are totally incapable of finding their way to the sheepfold, even when it, is in, when it is in plain sight. By nature, sheep are followers. I'm t told that if a sheep, uh, step, if the lead sheep steps off a cliff, that the others will probably follow him right over the end of the cliff. Additionally, sheep are easily susceptible to injuries and are utterly helpless against predators. If a predator enters a pen, a wolf, um, a dog, a coyote, they don't defend themselves. They won't, they won't try to run away. They actually gather up, they huddle up together, and it just makes them even easier pickings. They're, they're slaughtered that much easier. If a sheep falls into a moving water, they often drown. However, sheep do fear moving water and will not drink from any stream or lake unless the water is perfectly still. And we see that in Psalm 23. Um, David tells us that uh, of the shepherd who will make us to lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still waters. Shepherds were inseparable from their flock. The shepherd would lead the sheep to safe places to graze make them lie down for several hours in a shady place. Then as night fell, the shepherd would lead the sheep to protection of a sheepfold. Back in that time, there were a couple different kinds of sheepfolds or sheep pens. One was uh, like a public sheepfold that would be found in a city or a village. And this was kind of a communal one. People would bring their sheep there if they were coming in to buy, sell, or trade, or if they had business in town and they happened to be tending the sheep at that point and they would come and put them in into this sheepfold. And there was often a porter or a doorkeeper there whose duty it was to guard the door of the sheep pen during the night and then only allow shepherds in when they needed to get their sheep back out. And just like we saw in John chapter 10, the shepherds would call their sheep and each, of, each one of those sheep would know their master's voice. And even though they were mixed in with other flocks, it's my understanding that the sheep would know their their master's voice, and they would sort themselves out and follow him out the gate. The second kind of sheep pen was in the countryside where the shepherds would keep their flocks um, in good weather. This pen was often made out of um, just rocks or timbers, wood, different things that they laid up for a temporary fence. And there would be a, a hole in the fence, and that was the, the gate, of course. And once the sheep went in, the shepherd would often lay down there at night, right in the doorway, literally being the door to protect the sheep from predators. In this context, Jesus is telling us that he is not only the shepherd of the sheep, but he is also the door of the sheep. And in doing so, he is vividly contrasting himself to that of the religious leaders of his time, who he described as thieves and robbers. And we saw that in verse 8. When Jesus says, I am the door, he is reiterating the fact that not only through him is salvation possible. This is far removed from the teachings in today's, many of today's popular circles. Jesus makes it clear that any religious leader who offers salvation other than the teaching of Christ is a thief and a robber. Hebrews chapter 11, we often refer to that as the faith chapter. There's a number of accounts in there of Old Testament saints who walked and lived by faith, and it was counted to them as righteousness. These were individuals that, even before Christ had come to earth, um, and before they had much of the scriptures we have it today, they still understood and lived by faith. 
And in verse 6 it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that the reward and that he rewards those who seek him. <clears throat> One who believes the gospel and repents is assured of being in the fold and having entered by the door. As followers of Christ Jesus, as followers of Christ, Jesus is both our shepherd and the door to the sheepfold who provides for all our needs. First Peter chapter five is some supporting scripture. First Peter five. Verse eight. We are reminded that there are predators out there. First Peter five eight. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So it's real, right? We've probably all experienced this. We've gone through times in life where we feel like somebody or something is out to get us and that we're that sheep, we're that prey. Verse 9 and 10 go on. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Amen. Even though we live in a world where there are predators, we are going to experience God's grace as one of his children. We are called into glory in Christ, and he himself, Jesus himself, will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. So what is this abundant life? First, abundance is spiritual abundance, not material. In fact, God is not overly concerned with the physical circumstances of our lives. Do we believe that? God is not overly concerned with the physical circumstances of our lives. Someone texted me um, a week or so ago, something to this effect. God is more concerned with our character than he is our circumstances. God is more concerned with our character than he is our circumstances. He's more concerned about who we are, how we respond. When we're squeezed, what comes out of us? Not so much where he has put us, but how we respond and how we live through that. He assures us that we need not worry about what we will wear or eat. A familiar passage in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 25 to 32. I'll read that. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Philippians 4.19 also supports this, where it says that God will supply all of our needs. He will supply every need of ours. Physical blessings may or may not be part of a God-centered life. Neither our wealth nor our poverty is a sure indication of our standing with God. Solomon had all the material blessings available to a man, yet found it all meaningless Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes is probably one of my favorite books. I don't have to read it very long before I can either relate to something or something is speaking to me from it. Ephesians 5, 10 through 15. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. 
he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a labor laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I, will, that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Paul, on the other hand, kind of gives us the flip side of that, where he was content in whatever physical circumstances he found himself in. Philippians 4, 11 and 12 say, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Secondly, eternal life, the life a Christian is truly concerned with, is not determined by duration, but by a relationship with God. This is why once we accept Christ and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are said to have eternal life already. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. First John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Length of life on earth is not always synonymous with abundant life. Finally, a Christian's life revolves around growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see that in 2 Peter 3.18. This teaches us that the abundant life is a continual process of learning, practicing, and maturing, as well as failing, recovering, adjusting, enduring, and overcoming. In our present state, we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But yet one day we'll see God face to face, and we will know him completely as we'll, we will be known completely. We will no longer struggle with sin and doubt. We won't have the cares and the worries of this world, worry, anxiety, questions. This will be the ultimate, fulfilled, abundant life when we join him in eternity. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This section is talking about being a living, sa uh, living sacrifice, a service to God. In my Bible, I already had underlined what is good and acceptable and perfect, and under that I had written, believer's progression of understanding. As we grow and mature in life, and as we gain understanding, this is often a little bit of a progression here, that we understand what is good, eventually we understand what is more acceptable, and then as we get closer to being like Christ and more in his image, we understand what is perfect to him. Just as we become new creations when we come to Christ, so must our understanding of abundance be transformed. Our challenge here for myself and for us is that we live out the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Th that's what our focus will be on, not an abundance of stuff, but on an abundance of living out those different character traits. It consists of life that is eternal, and therefore our interest is in the eternal, not the temporal, not the things here on earth necessarily. 
Paul admonishes us in Colossians 3, 2 and 3, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. As we turn our attention now to the Lord's Supper and Communion, may we focus specifically on Christ as the living example that we had, living a perfect, abundant life, and willingly going to the cross to give himself up for my sin, for our sins, and then overcoming death.